-hmm. Please. Uh, you spoke about conservative um, obstructionism when it came to the deficit. And President Obama and the administration has always sought to, always sought to try and find compromise, especially mm -hmm. with health care. I was just wondering if you feel whether the administration has sometimes gone too far to try and get compromise and whether it's been detrimental to the country or whether he's been uh, trying to find nonpartisan solutions for too many problems. Yeah, I, I, um, that's a very good question and it is one, um, as indicated by the name in corner, it, it, is, it is definitely one that, it, that the White House and uh, other folks wrestle with a lot. But I don't think the president has gone too far and I think the president should continue to do what he's done which is reach out and try to find common ground. Um, the, the reason for that is it, it's been frustrating. You know, I deal with the, the president a lot. It's been frustrating to him to have felt like, you know, gosh, economic recovery, this should be bipartisan. We're in the worst ditch we've been since the 1930s. Can't we pull together in a government of national unity like Churchill had during the 1940s to have every House Republican as a matter of pride say they were going to vote against the stimulus package before the package was even rolled out? was extremely disappointing. But when the president is reaching out to the other side, he's not doing it primarily for the other side. He's doing it primarily because that's what American citizens want to see. They want to see leaders working together to solve big problems. And he feels like if he does it and keeps doing it, at some point there might be breaks and, and, and you might find Republican members willing to vote his way. Um, a number of Republican members, for example, did vote for the climate bill uh, in the House that passed last June. A few Republicans, including Senator Scott Brown, you know, who was, who was uh, kind of a, got a lot of ink earlier in the year, but actually Scott Brown voted with the president on the Wall Street financial reform bill that came out of the Senate. So while we may not be able to get many coming our way, you're not going to get folks to come your way if you don't keep reaching out. I do think the strategy of how to reach out may have evolved a little bit, though, in the White House in response to your question. So instead of reaching out and then trying to dilute what we want to do to chase after somebody's votes, and then they vote against it anyway. I think the right strategy to reach out is to earnestly solicit people's points of view. And any time there's a good idea, then that ought to get put in whatever the bill is. If it's the, if it's the Wall Street reform bill, a good idea that a Republican in advanced ought to have as easy a chance of getting in that bill as if a Democrat advanced it. So we, you earnestly solicit ideas, you take good ideas, the Senate version of the health care bill had about 150 Republican amendments that worked their way into the Senate bill. You find the good ideas, you put them in, but you don't chase after people and dilute what you want to do because it'll be like Lucy in the football. She'll gonna, she'll probably pull the football out anyway, but we just need to listen. We keep needing to reach out because that's what the American public wants us to do. Please. Governor Kane, you gave a great 30-minute exposition of how wonderful the Democrats have been and what a great job they have done these past two years. The Democrats control the House with a large majority and the Senate with a large majority, and they control the White House. Mm -hmm. So I have two questions. Given that complete control of the government, how is it that you can still blame Republicans? And second of all, if the Democratic Congress has done such a great job, why does it have an approval rating of only 22% and thus a disapproval rate of about 75%. Um, great questions. And so I'll take them in the order you asked them. Um, I, I don't think I blamed Republicans for anything that's happened since the Democrats have had control. We have control, and so we've exercised control to go from losing 750,000 jobs a month to gaining 500,000 a month. We've exercised control to take a GDP that was shrinking by 6% a year and turned it into one that's now growing by 5% a year. We exercised control to take a stock market that was on a plunge to 6,000 and get it up to the point where it's at 10,000. The work of the last couple of years that Democrats have done uh, has turned the economy around. We're not where we want to be yet and we haven't been perfect. Um, I think we could have done more if Republicans would have been willing to get on board, but assuming they're not, we are in control. What we've done in the last year and a half, I'm very, very glad to be held accountable for that. What I, but, but, but I did think it was important to give the history lesson because history is important. The decade that we just came through really was a lost decade in American life that was unparalleled since the 1930s. We've not had a decade in American life where there was zero job growth since the 1930s. We've not had a decade in American life where household incomes went down or where household GDP uh, per capita went down. We had a, 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 a nearly unparalleled run 
of economic disaster, frankly, during the, uh, the decade that preceded the president coming into office. Um, a, a budget surplus that was historic had turned into a massive budget deficit. And it is very important to, to point that out to show where the starting spot was, where we were in January of 2009 when this president came into office. With respect to the second question, dealing with polling, it is the case that Congress ain't too popular right now. That's, that's very much the case. Um, I think that the anxieties that Americans feel about the economy, which continues to be tough, makes it tough for anybody in elected office, Democrat, Republican, or otherwise. Because if you ask the uh, American public, what do you think of Congress, you don't get a great, you know, you don't get a great percentage. If you split out and ask, what do you think of Democratic congressional members and Republican congressional members, there's quite a gap. Neither are much to write home about, but the gap between Democrats and Republicans are heavily in Democrats' advantage. In, every month, Gallup asks the American public, do you want to see a Congress that is Democratic or Republican controlled? And for about six months or so, in late 09, early 10, uh, the answer was Republican controlled by about a margin of six points. Last month it switched to Democrat by seven points. We'll see what it does going forward. But the interesting thing about the switch was the questioners explaining why they were switching. And here was the, the kind of the generic answer. You know, we don't like everything that Democrats are doing, but they're trying. They're willing to do heavy lifting on health care. They're willing to do heavy lifting on the stimulus. They're trying to reform uh, Wall Street. What are the other guys doing except throwing rocks? And throwing rocks might be fine if everything was going great, but when you're in the midst of the second toughest economy since the 1930s, and one of the two main political parties has decided that they want to root for the president's failure, there's just not that much to like about that strategy. So we got a lot of work to do. We're not where we want to be yet. Um, but I think there are differentials in pollings that would demonstrate that there is a grudging recognition uh, that those Democratic majorities have turned GDP around, have turned the stock market around, have turned jobs around, and we ought to keep climbing rather than slip backwards. Mm -hmm. um, sir, you mentioned about common ground. Mm -hmm. Well, I see quite recently we have two um, issues of common ground. The, the recent minor disaster that has happened in West Virginia right. and the current oil spill that's happening in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. I've spent my times as a youth in the Gulf of the well, so I'm sure. familiar with that area. Mm -hmm. What's it going to take for Democrats and Republicans and independents to pull all the differences aside and create p public policy, parts create regulation reform, mm -hmm. parts in the mining industry and the oil industry? Um, great question. Um, it, it is a sad fact, but it is nevertheless a fact, uh, that sometimes it takes a, a significant challenge, disaster, catastrophe for us to get the backbone to do the things that we need to do. There was a, uh, an ideological view that deregulation would be good, that deregulation would produce economic growth without compromising safety. And although you always have to wrestle with what's the right level of regulation and not have too much, the notion that you can deregulate your way to success has pretty much been rebutted by the Wall Street collapse, some of the challenges in the mining and drilling industry. So in addition to capping and cleaning up, your point is the one that's the most important. What do we do to put policy in place to make sure these kinds of things don't happen again? Um, and, and I do think that there can be common ground on some of these issues. Again, on the mining regulation side, um, we don't want to be a country, and there are countries like this in the world that just casually accepts the deaths of miners as just, well, that's just a natural thing that's going to happen every year. We can put regulations in place that will protect the safety of individuals, and that shouldn't be a partisan issue. There, I, I, I've got to believe that as we dig into what the right regulatory framework is, that there will be members of Republican members of Congress who will also see it the same way. Um, with respect to, to BP and the Gulf, you know, we're skirmishing now about the president uh, got BP to put up money for a claims process and the leading Republican on the relevant committee apologized to BP for that. We're skirmishing about some things like that. But the big game here is the one that's, the, is the one about our energy policy as a nation. President Nixon said we need to find a better energy future where we're not relying so much on oil and on imported oil. And yet, even since Nixon, many presidents have said the same thing and we haven't really advanced beyond it. 